So again, thank you all for coming to hear me. I can't imagine uh, wanting to listen to me for an hour or three, but uh, I'm glad that you're, you're here. Uh, as I was said, I took up this postdoctoral fellowship here at Regent uh, in, in January, and uh, I took up this position after many years of teaching in the applied health sciences, uh, as well as researching and writing as a theologian in bioethics and medical humanities. Uh, this position that I've taken up has resourced the time and the space to read, uh, to, to think, and to write. It's quite a gift. Uh, it's also resourced the time and space to engage uh, with a number of people. But part of my work is to work on some publications, including uh, a book project, uh, a book that takes up uh, a global crisis, and I'm taking up uh, the crisis of, of technology. Uh, what I'm going to present to you tonight is, is the first chapter of four in this book, so you get a, a sneak peek of what I'm working on. I've written two chapters, so the book is not complete. My thinking is not complete. Uh, so your questions and your comments afterward will be very much appreciated. It will only make the volume that much stronger. But while I've been here at Regent, I've also had the, the, the opportunity to engage with students in and out of the classroom. During such an opportunity, a few months passed, I was, I was asked a question. Students sort of know I'm doing work here in the question of technology. I was asked the question, are there any industrial technologies or uses of technologies that Christians, sh uh, that Christians ought to condemn and to condemn boldly, and then why? I offered a, a pretty curt response in the first instance. I said, I would encourage us to condemn industrial technologies of war, including rockets retaliating from warships towards so-called targets, as though one is aiming for inanimate objects, while discounting, discounting the human price and the many persons gathered. I would condemn the industries of war and the economic machinations that make killing en masse possible. Why? The folly of war and the callousness of violence are obvious. But my Anabaptist sensibilities sort of shine through here. And so uh, a more, more tempered response, if I was to offer that to the student, which I did not, uh, I would say this. I would encourage us to look beyond mere industrial technologies and consider both moral and political techniques. Thus, I would condemn technologies where, as Gabriel Marcel forewarned, personality, particularity, and difference are effectively amputated until the situation of each of us becomes as similar as possible to that of our neighbor. I would condemn those techniques where persons are reduced by the will to form, as Karl Barth lamented. I would condemn with Michel Henry the barbarous disposition where everything that can be done by science ought to be done by it and for it, since there is nothing but science and the reality that it names, objective reality. Such a reality is one in which culture is lost, where dialogue and difference is replaced by monologue and homogeneity, where power to form usurps creativity, restraining the freedom for life. I would contest those techniques that constrain human vocation and replace meaningful labor of any kind with a type of dehumanizing measure that makes persons replaceable, as though such persons are mere cogs, nameless, faceless, meaningless cogs, only meaningful for particular ends, useful only when performing the designated function. Meaning is a, as, part, as a part delimited and bounded by the technological machinery. In my, in my book, short plug, uh, reading Karl Barth, Interrupting Moral Technique, Transforming Biomedical Ethics, not the, not the sexiest of titles, um, but in, in that book, I confront, I confront the apparatus of the common morality 
the common morality incumbent to the contemporary biomedical ethics. I argue that this, it, it functions as a moral technique. It determines moral speech, and it cares fairly little about the panoply and the particularity of persons that are captured by crises of life and death. Instead, I argue that we ought to demonstrate in our ethics solidarity to persons, not principles, attending to actual crises that demand decision rather than, 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 than a priori constructs that determine both question and answer before the crisis. So I would encourage that we protest such ethics and refuse to set aside persons, neighbors, to be sure, both near and far. I refuse to set aside the peculiarity of Christian ethics when we sit down at the ethics round table. But in telling this story of questions and answers, and by introducing this lecture as I have, I, I seem to have already jumped a bit too far forward. I've given a sense of my posture towards technology, but without clear boundaries, without an identifiable purpose. So let me get to the purpose and content of this lecture so that my answers make a bit more sense. I trust that throughout tonight, we might all begin to understand what technology is and how it has impacted us so that we might all come to see the fate of the modern world. One thing is certain, in addition to both taxation and death, we live amidst the ubiquity of technology. Hans Jonas referred to technology as the focal fact of the present age. Our present age is one in which beliefs in or of God might remain an option, as Charles Taylor has argued in a secular age. But encounters with various technologies is not. It is, at very least, an age in which it is disproportionately difficult to remain a Luddite. Technology pervades almost everything vital to our existence, material, mental, and spiritual. As such, we are a technological civilization. As such, we have taken hold of the powers to make and to remake our world. But we often wonder where and how to deploy these powers, or we wonder whether we ought to deploy these powers at all. The question of power is one that we must wrestle with in our present age. We not only possess power in various forms, but we are becoming increasingly aware of, of how much power we possess or can possess with the advent of certain new knowledge and mechanical progress. One needs only to consider the atomic powers wrought from the theoretical and physical sciences of the last centuries and determined necessary by the industries of energy and of war. Powers harnessed that with renewed global political unrest and failing infrastructures threaten once again both ecology and security. Consider, too, the powers that reify the strata of geology and, and liberate gaseous energy reserves from the bowels of the earth through hydraulic fracturing, but possibly risk the destabilization of faults and the contamination of groundwater. In addition to such powers implemented to harness and, and release energies and to control natural resources, we have over the last Several decades proffered increasing knowledge and developing powers to create and to recreate biological life and to remediate the deleterious effects of aging, dysfunction, and disease with particular advances that emerged from genetic, epigenetic, and genomic research and their complementary biotechnologies. We also face the inevitable human experiment to transplant a viable body from a vegetative donor, attaching it to the head of another person whose body is otherwise terminally ill. A potentiality made possible in part by advances in chemical, neurological, and medical surgical sciences. Such powers are commonly cited to demonstrate the promise and peril of modern scientific and technological progress, both fostering the potential of extreme longevity and revealing the potentiality for dystopic futures. 
With such examples, one might be able to understand in our late modern context just how much power humanity has amassed and is pursuing. Many more examples could be introduced, ranging from the powers that emerged through the earliest mass printing presses and steam engines through to powers of nanotechnologies and brain chip interfaces. One might also extend the imagination beyond mere machinery, pointing towards technologies incumbent again in, in politics and ethics. Second plug for my book. Uh, my analysis of biomedical ethics, where I have shown the common morality theory of James Childress and Tom Beeschamp, among other bioethics modalities, to be a moral technique. Regardless of which examples one might introduce, and whether thought good or ill, the power is what is most interesting. Such power is interesting because, as philosopher, philosopher Emmanuel Mestin suggested, the acquisition of power is what is new in our present age. He said that, that we are among the first who can aspire to be free of the tyranny of physical nature which has haunted humanity from the beginning. And such aspirations correspond well with what technology was for Mesthene, an organization of knowledge for the purpose of accomplishing practical aims and achievements. That's Mesthene's definition of what technology is. However, before we can assess such power and guide human action accordingly, we must beg particular questions about the essential nature of technology and wherein or whereupon which it has been exercised. We might begin exploring such questions by asking a corollary question. Is Mestine's definition of technology suitable? More simply, how should we understand technology? What is technology? The answer for what might seem a simple question, is actually difficult to establish. Indeed, a great many have labored to delimit and to define technology. Consider in our Canadian context, George Parkin Grant, the Catholic Anglican public intellectual and political philosopher, who sought on several occasions to examine the essential nature of technology. For Grant, knew that secular modern civilization is committed to human autonomy without God and to science, technology, and industry guided only by human purposes. Of course, when considering human purposes in the technological age, one is not considering teleology as in classical philosophy, sort of these Aristotelian goods, intrinsic goods, but rather this, this, the monolithic reality, as Grant sort of describes, of the modern liberal society, namely mastery. Such mastery is concerned principally with the liberation of the individual from nature and the human condition, a condition marked by toil, fragility, and finitude. Now, it's important to note that the terms technology and technique are often confused and confusing. To complicate matters more, I tend to use the terms with relative imprecision, as is probably clear by now. And the conventions for usage of the terms tend to be different depending upon geography. There's a, a European preference for technique, a North American preference for technology. To be sure, however, with, with either term, I intend for us to study the modern oddity of the terms and how they are to be understood such that we might be able to examine the essential nature of things, specifically the essential nature of the technological society or the technological age. And so as I want to do this so that we don't fall into the trappings of, of uncritical optimism, yay technology, uh, or biased pessimism, boo technology, or willful ignorance when considering the significance of technology. I don't know, who cares? I want to, I want to avoid those. Thus, the importance 
of examining definitions. I want to arrive at a preferred meaning for our understanding this evening and for, of course, the following conversations that emerge uh, among us here as well as uh, in, my, in my book. For many, the parallel meaning of these terms ought to include the, the, the means of, of tasks performed or procedures constructed that with order and precision, regulation and control, expect to reproduce a particular means or, or manufacture a particular commodity. I want to include that. Consider further French existentialist philosopher Gabriel Marcel. He defined technique as a group of procedures methodologically elaborated and consequently capable of being taught and reproduced. And when these procedures are put into operation, they assure, some, uh, uh, they assure something, they assure the achievement of some definite concrete purpose. His definition parallels that of Messina, which focused on the organization of knowledge for practical purposes. Order, procedure, and reproducibility towards achieving a particular aim are common traits to the respective definitions. Yet Marcel, Marcel continued by suggesting that a technique is something that we might acquire, learn, or possess by habit, therefore warning, uh, if one can become the slave of one's habits, it is equally probable that that one can become a prisoner of techniques. Such a warning will be explored later in further detail, but it, it does raise a necessary hazard for definitions. A hazard that, that we need to attend to at some point. Who or what is being mastered? Warnings withstanding, though set to the background, let us continue to illuminate the, po the possible meaning of technology, turning again to to George Grant's essay, Thinking About Technology. In this important essay, Grant labored to examine the meaning of technology. He preferred the North American iteration, which brings to mind uh, the whole apparatus of instruments made by humans and placed at the, disposable, the disposal of humans for their choices and purposes. Once again, we might see a parallel with Mestine's definition above, specifically in each of the definitions introduced so far, there is a particular rationality that delimits the meaning of technique or technology. This rationality is, is one in which reified or objective nature, including human nature, is studied, ordered, and ultimately controlled. Studied, ordered, and controlled for the purpose of acquiring particular powers or attaining particular commodities through the apparatus that's possessed or practiced. So, as we discern further the meaning of the concomitant terms, two observations, I think, come to the foreground. First, the definition so far position human will over technology, which is to be used for our service, for our benefit. Technology is advanced so as to grasp hold of the aims pursued by humanity. Second, technology represents a schema or strata of ordinal practices, parts or procedures that by their construction determine the ends that are sought. That's to say, the apparatus introduced by a given technology provides the means for accomplishing the desired aim. They guarantee the commodity will be produced, and produced with an efficiency of form and a determination that delimits the use of said technology. Unfortunately, the determining of, tech, of the technology to produce or to procure the commodity for, for which it was crafted it seems to challenge the creative agency introduced in the first observation. These two points seem to conflict a little bit. Take note then, the second observation returns us to the counsel observed by Marcel previously, begging the question of who's 
the master. Yet before we turn to such matters, more still needs to be said to acquire a clear understanding of these terms. In his early writing, George Grant also pointed his reader to the French philosopher and sociologist Jacques Ellul. Specifically, Grant suggested that uh, two books of Ellul, The Technological Society, uh, as well as his Propaganda, uh, are required reading for all of us who wish to best understand present life caught up in what Grant describes as the dynamo of our technological societies, this endless reciprocal problem resolution associated with, with technology. So it seems appropriate if Grant says we should read Alul, well, maybe we should, maybe we should too. In a manner comparable to Jonas, Jacques Alul observed that technology is decisive in coming to understand our present age. For Alul, such an observation is fashioned with disquieted lament, and his dirge follows. Human beings wholly now live in conditions that are less than human. These conditions are the outcome of technique determining the areas of life once subject to either necessity or fate are now susceptible to intervention and various manner of control by the exercise of human will and industry embodied in the mechanisms of technique. Such intervention is the technological interruption necessitated by the emergence of preceding technological advances. Yet, Ellul regarded the technological interruption as more than a mere nuisance. In interrupting human life as it has done, technology shows itself, it reveals itself to behave as a clandestine tyrant that absorbs all in its path into a great totalitarian homogenous whole. Putting to work those that seek to dominate, that it seeks to dominate. An appropriate, albeit somewhat dated, cultural image may be offered in television's Star Trek, The Next Generation. Awesome. Uh, in this series, we see uh, this, this, the image of technology personified, the tyranny of technology personified in the form of the Borg an alien species of cybernetic organisms that assimilate all to work as one for the collective and who warn that resistance is futile. The dated image, because I used that example in a class once, it fell pretty flat. Uh, I, I'm getting older, I guess. Concerned about such tyranny, Elul was quick to point towards cautionary notes rather than to develop an apologetic for technology. While technology is a power that promises to give liberation, strength, facility, simplification, and enrichment, it fails to live up to the promise. This is, this is not to suggest technology does not do what it sets out to do. Rather, it actually accomplishes its, its, its aims most Effectively. The problem is that under its easily won rule, the very social structures of, of human life change. They become determined by technique. Humanity in the modern society, the technological society, is thus determined to be increasing, increasingly passive, diminished to act only when called upon by political instruction or by the demands of technology but never to act as a creative individual, only as a mere mechanism in the systems of progress and power. Thus, under the weight and rule of technological tyranny, Elul lamented, a society cannot be free or strong or competent or otherwise. It can only be efficient. The diminution of society is what was at stake for Elul. Similar concerns can be seen in the work of Lewis Mumford, who was concerned that a transition from tool using to machine serving would capture human purpose and put it to work toward achieving the technological order of being, the remaking of all things in the image of the machine. Mumford, however, gives us pause before capitulating to a, more, to a biased pessimism 
reminding us that, that tool techniques is but a fragment of biotechniques, man's total equipment for life. For Mumford, every technology is but an extension of the body. For Mumford, humanity in her early form survived with the tools of most creatures. Teeth, hands, feet and the like. Such tools gave these persons the time to craft extra bodily tools that eventually enriched uh, the technology they shared with the beasts while also benefiting her life in new ways. The body, bodily correlates of our Technologies are best exemplified in simple levers and various mechanics that build and carve, burrow and heave. Yet Mumford's image here is less obvious in the present iteration of the technological age where zeros and ones, qubits and algorithms often code the way of modern technique. Mumford's reflection reminds us that not all are entirely morose regarding technology. The concerns raised are, are valid and, and duly noted even by apologists of technology, yet responding to the cautions and concerns, some reply predictably as those marching to order inside the omnipresent dynamo of the technological society. Oh wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is! Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Oh, brave new world in which we have been determined by technology to believe the challenges facing humanity can be solved by the technological fix. In Aldous Huxley's important novel, Brave New World, John the Savage quotes this verse from Shakespeare's The Tempest several times. O oh wonder, O oh brave new world. This reflects John's initial amazement of the state of things in the world outside the reservation where he was raised. However, as John continues to repeat this verse through Huxley's novel, his wonder at the brave new world changes. First corresponding to his expression of amazement, but changing to mocking derision and ultimately to a, pet, a poetic exclamation of protest. One might consider Mistheen's position regarding technology to be similar to John's first glance. The panoply of problems facing humanity is to be remedied by the continuing advance of human intelligence, ingenuity, and industry. Such industry is not reducible to mechanical innovation, but through the adoption of technique in moral and political spheres. So he writes, this is Mestine, technological innovation therefore leads ultimately to a need for social and political innovation if its benefits are to be fully realized and its negative effects kept to a minimum. This claim actually helps us to further understand the terms we are attempting to define. You see, philosophers... Prophets to some, like George Grant, Jacques Ellul, Gabriel Marcel, among others, expose us to the breadth of technology in our present society, expanding its semantics and determining impact across a, a wide range. It's important, therefore, to take notice in these attempts to delimit and to define technology that we are, are not being introduced to mere machines. That's a mistake, to reduce technology to mere machines. Technology is not intended to simply connote the various ways that cogs agitate and reel to pull levers and to push debris, although machines such as the dragline excavators, oil derricks, and combine harvesters that dot the horizon of the southeast Saskatchewan homeland from where I was raised are indeed technologies. But we can't reduce technology, the idea of technology to these machines. No. Rather, technology, as Grant made clear, is the ontology of our age. It's the way the world is. It's the way the world has become in our late modern context. It's the way the world has been becoming since possibly gnosis or knowledge was preferenced over phusis, being. 
And since the West preference ordered reasoning over participatory mystery, as some have exemplified, occurring as early as the Filioque schism, the break between the East and the Western Church. As such, rather than adopting either term, technology or technique, we might be wise to prefer the term techno-ontology. The, the idea of tech, techno-ontology, um, technology is not merely a concept or a construction, but a way of seeing or a determining of our way of seeing the world. Techno-ontology can therefore include a compendium of industrial, political, and moral machinery that, that instrumentalizes knowing for the purposes of doing and bureaucratizes both the control and the management of persons surveyed by the gaze and corresponding judgment of technique. It is techno-ontology that concerns many who have issued comment thus far. Techno-ontology and its clandestine ty tyranny to, to make everything into an image of efficient form should stir not only concern, but possibly protest. Why protest, some might ask. Let us understand, and on the basis of our common understanding, protest. Ursula Franklin, in her 1989 Massey lectures, although positive that redemptive technologies can be used to shape new practices of working and living together, concluded her original lectures while reciting the phrase attributed to the British peace movement, which protested the placement of missiles on home soil. Again, let us understand, and on the basis of our common understanding, protest. This was the phrase of the British peace movement. Just as those of the peace movement called forth protests from fellow British citizens, Franklin challenged her listener to protest and to survive technology or to survive techno-ontology until there is change in the structures, I should say there, change in the structures and practices of the real world of technology. For only then can we hope to survive as a community. She concluded with a, a final clarion call. If such basic change cannot be accomplished, the house of technology, or, or the house that technology built, will be nothing more than an unlivable techno dump. Such a call to protest might have come a bit early in this lecture, for we continue to labor in our understanding. But with Marcel's warning above and now Franklin's tempered lament, it's also becoming clear that in discussing techno-ontology and the powers that correspond, we're not discussing a, a small matter. Rather, we're discussing everything. If one is to examine the meaning of technology as the ontology of our age, if one is to attend to the essential nature of technology, we have to turn somewhere. We have to turn to the forerunner of the many who have taken up to answer the question of technology, that being the German philosopher, Martin Heidegger. The question concerning technology is considered by many to be the seminal work on technology. But Heidegger, like, uh, he joins the likes of, 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 of Mumford, among others, who share uh, a particular historical peri uh, period emerging from the Second World War. They share this time. For such thinkers, the crisis of civilization was one where the machine dominated and where the promises of modernity proved to be perilous. Yet Heidegger's critique of technology does not share the underlying optimism that one might read in Mumford's work. Mumford's work. Nevertheless, Heidegger's technology was published in 1954. Uh, there was an earlier original manuscript written uh, five years previous uh, for, the, for the Bremen lectures. Technology, as it appeared later, was a revision of the second part of this four-lecture series. 
It was Heidegger's first public lecture after the war. For Heidegger, World War II was a moment in world history that revealed the end of modernity, where great achievements of modern will, reason, and technique gave way to, the, to both great dehumanization and absolute destruction. His essays, therefore, attended to, to what is as thought and realized in light of that climax of modernity. Technology became his treatise on what technology is and how humanity might correspond to it. The aim of, of Heidegger's volume was introduced in the opening paragraph. He says, We shall be questioning technology, and in so doing, we would like to prepare a free relationship to it. The relationship will be free if it opens up our human existence to the essence of technology. The exercise of questioning was, was done not to raise concern about the essence of technology per se, rather the exercise of questioning was performed to probe the corners and the contours of our relationship to technology. He wrote accordingly, thus we shall never experience our relationship, our relationship to the essence of technology so long as we merely conceive and push forward the technological, put up with it, or evade it. Everywhere we remain unfree and chained to technology, whether we passionately affirm or deny it. Therefore, in his attempt to discern the essence of technology, Heidegger began with the observation concerning the correct understanding of what technology is, specifically Heidegger noted two answers often offered. These will be familiar to us. First, technology is, is a means to an end. Second, technology is a human activity. Those are responses that are instrumental and anthropological. They're responses that are very difficult, if not impossible, to deny. They therefore conceive and push forward the technological without further questioning. Yeah, that's what technique is. That's what technology is. Yeah, we're done. We've answered it. Why am I still talking? But for Heidegger, these two definitions conceal the essential nature as they represent conventional understanding. Indeed, conventional understanding is, is difficult to deny. Consider scissors. Simple devices that provide the efficient and, and valuable means of cutting various materials from paper to wire, shear curtains to sheet metal. Scissors fix the edges of two sharpened blades to a pivot, creating a simple machine. A class one lever, I think. We have physicists in the room. They, they can correct me on that. Uh, in this way, scissors provide the means for applying sheer force to resources for the end aim of predictably cutting materials to form. These tools correspond to the traditional in order to of technologies that might have been reflected in the writings uh, of, of Aristotle or other classic thinkers. Yet while this tool suits the correct or conventional definitions of technology, such definitions, or the tools that are used to validate them, do not reveal the essence of technology. They fail to capture what technology is in a modern sense today. Various artifacts of technology are made and implemented by human agents whose aim is to gain mastery over the products of their use. And the will to such mastery be becomes increasingly urgent as the powers wrought from the advance of technology threaten to become unwieldy. The instrumental and the anthropological definitions are therefore unsatisfactory. That is, repeating myself, such definitions occlude rather than disclose the essential nature of technology. Scissors are designed for the human agent to provide the human force to wield the lever against the material being formed by the cutting exercise. One can't deny that the scissor tool is a fitting example 
of a technology is defined by those conventional definitions. Yet neither the scissor nor its implementation against the raw material it aims to shape help us to understand the essence of technology. These merely reinforce conventional understanding, which at once is conditional rather than essential understanding. So if the conventional definition isn't sufficient, what is technology? Why haven't I answered that question yet? It's a good, good question. Heidegger probed this question again and again throughout his, his, his treaties. To be sure, Heidegger was confident that technology is not a new phenomenon. He was clear that technology and the imposition of human will to take hold of and to master nature, to grasp or to give shape to nature, including human nature, has been pursued in the West for centuries, dating back as early as the ancient Greeks, if not further. He talks about, for example, um, the habits of virtue as an example. Rather, human beings, he argued, are created by nature and thus committed to world-making through various modalities ranging from language to the making and implementation of tools to bring forth or to reveal the human world. For Heidegger, this is what was meant by the Greek verb poesis, to make or to transform the world. Human beings, therefore, have been committed to the decisive actions of world-making and to revealing the essential nature of the relationship between nature and humanity. However, a question must follow. If, techne if technology as poesis, as, as a world-making, has always been in relation to human creative agency, what is different in the modern world? What stirred Heidegger to continue probing the question of technology, asking and asking and asking the same question. The answer might rest in Heidegger's observation that modern technology inframes. To inframe is novel to the modern age, and in contradistinction to the long labor of becoming ready to live in the world. Inframing is the way we are determined to see the world the way we're determined to see each other, the way we're determined to see ourselves. Put differently, the inframing concerns this determinative, determinative meaning-making of modern technology that sees in nature, including human nature, the raw material to be used for something. When such raw material is proven to be an object without use, though, is discarded or disposed. Listen to the words of Hermann Hesse. Imagine a garden with, with, hundreds, with hundreds of trees, thousands of flowers, hundreds of kinds of fruit and vegetable. Suppose then that the gardener of this garden, this beautiful garden, knew no other distinction than between edible and inedible. Nine-tenths of this garden would be useless to him. He would pull up the most enchanting flowers and hew down the noblest trees and even regard them with a loathing, an envious eye. So in being used, objects of nature, inert until acted upon, become, become something but only in relation to their instrumental usage. Only in relation to the inter instrumental usage determined by calculable plans and measures. Therefore, the material object, including human material, becomes inframed by purpose which is not natural, but commodified. Here we might be reminded of Mistine's belief that technology might be defined as an organization of knowledge for the purpose of accomplishing practical aims and achievements. However, Mistine is not following Heidegger's analysis. Rather than in framing meaning, he believes technology is open to a range of possible effects. Once again, Mistine's 
wonder might reflect John the Savage's initial expressions of amazement and awe. At very least, Mestine's remains positive. For Heidegger, however, the essence of technology that was unveiled by the horrors of the Second World War is much more sinister. The essence of technology in the modern world, which Heidegger sought to understand, is not technology itself. It is not located by the conventional definitions given thus far. Remember, technology is a means to an end and technology is a human activity. Rather, the essence of technology makes modern ingenuity and industry possible by revealing a world where everything is observed as a raw material, a raw material awaiting meaning-making activity. Waiting, standing at the, at the ready to be used for a purpose, or waiting with unremitting anxiety to be discarded as purposeless. So what is the essence of technology? Technology is more than a mundane tool for human agency to pursue particular ends of, of mastery and control. Technology represents the, the learned posture of modern humanity. It's a posture committed to a type of knowing which seeks to control all of nature, including our own, in an attempt at instrumental meaning-making. It is the way in which we have been trained to see everything in the world, including we in it. A collection of inert machines awaiting animation or annihilation. Thus, by, reve by such revealing, by such training, the now familiar maxim, knowledge is power, comes to, to mean the power to master the material universe by inframing it to form, by inframing it to function for, for a purpose imposed upon raw material. And humanity has certainly demonstrated a profound capacity for mastery. We know this. Such mastery has been exercised by human agency committed to and determined by the forward campaign of technological progress. And this is the challenge for humanity benefiting from such progress. The imperative purposes proffered by technology to pursue mastery and the outcomes so far achieved make it extremely difficult to criticize the essential nature and continued promise of technology. Yeah, I think criticism is warranted. Maybe protest even. Why? Again, the issue has to do with power. And power that can grasp the good by will. As the hand of Adam that grasps hold the fruit of a tree. Such rationality is exemplified in the Renaissance, with both René Descartes and Francis Bacon standing as principal representatives of the period. Descartes, for example, in his Discourse on Method, thought it promising to that emerging knowledge from a utilitarian method would resolve problems of labor, vitality, and aging. The commodities uh, such aims acquired justified the pursuit of scientific inquiry and technological innovation. Likewise, Francis Bacon, uh, the, the maxim above is often attributed to him, resolved the scientific method as the, the mechanism that, that might give strength for dominating nature. It was where human knowledge and human power do really meet in one. Various techniques that accompany modern knowing become the way said knowledge or said power was put to work, shaping the elemental world to form and set towards resolving the problems of pain and to bolster the benefits of pleasure. For Bacon, this was the end or the aim of science. His new Atlantis imaged or imagined a society dedicated to the pursuit of science in the domination of nature. The rationality emerging from the Renaissance exemplified a will to master. It exemplified a will to power. However, as Heidegger has forewarned, the will to mastery becomes all the more urgent 
the more technology threatens to slip from human control. In the age of exclusive power of power, being, or human existence, risks becoming conscripted. It risks becoming used up and forgotten in the ongoing struggle for mastery over that which is elemental. Heidegger is concerned that human beings risk becoming raw material, awaiting meaning-making activity. George Grant has captured a similar concern, warning human agency might be lost as, as one is captured by the endlessly reciprocating technological mechanism. The dynamo where technological solutions are introduced, or rather demanded, to meet the emergencies which technology has produced in the first instance. So rather than meaningful creative agency, one is caught in the, in the calculable machination of the will-to-will -will technology. It is no wonder that Hans Jonas declared that technology is the focal fact of modern life, touching everything that is vital for existence, calculating the earth, and subduing the particularity of being. The focal fact of modern life, or technology, is more than a commonplace tool for human agency to pursue ends of mastery and control. The very technology developed to bring the world, including the self, under the control of human will and energy threatens to radically reconstruct and possibly destroy human being, seizing power over and against human control. It might have already done so. So we must ask ourselves, the following questions of Heidegger. Should one understand this as a mere and unlikely warning or as an apt description of what is? Should one understand this as dubious folly or emerging fate? Technology is everything. The ontology of our age. If that is the case, then what might we expect? This is a question taken up by George Grant in an interview by Gad Horowitz, who's uh, now Emeritus Professor of Political Science at, at Toronto. The interview was held at Grant's Ontario home in 1969. I'm going to recite the first two questions and responses given. So this is Horowitz asking the question. What do you mean when you describe our society as a technological society? Grant, probably smoking a cigarette, followed by another one and another one. He's a prolific chain smoker. It was amazing. Uh, Grant says, I mean that this is a society in which people think of the world around them as, as mere indifferent stuff, which they're absolutely free to control any way they want through technology. I don't think of the technological society as something outside us. You know, just, just like a bunch of machines. It's a whole way of looking at the world. The basic way Western humanity experience their own existence in the world. Out of it comes large organizations, bureaucracies, machines, and the belief that all problems can be solved scientifically in an immediate, quantifiable way. The technological society is one in which men uh, or persons are bent on dominating and controlling human and non-human nature. Horvitz then interrupts, and out of this dominating, aggressive relationship with nature grows a situation in which human beings are prevented from existing truly as human beings. Their lives are shaped to conform to the requirements of technological progress. They thus become subordinated to their own technology. How do you, how do you mean this? In what ways can we see it? In what ways are we as human beings damaged by the technological relationship with nature? Horowitz asks. Grant responds. I think that fundamentally... We don't quite know what has happened to us. What I try to say in technology and empire is that we must try to think 
what it is to live in modern North America. We who have walked the streets of the great metropolis and seen the giant wars of this century and live in highly organized institutions which determine us more than we determine them must feel the need not only to live but to know, to think of our living. Otherwise, we're at the mercy of it. And it seems to me, at the moment that we are at the mercy of the technological machine we have built, and every time anything difficult happens, we add to the machine. We have more science to add to the difficulties that science itself has created. Now, this predicament is too enormous in the history of the race to permit one to say, I'm against it, or I'm for it. The main thing, you know, in my life, is just to see what it is. Technology is the metaphysics of our age, you know, as we know what metaphysics is. Technology is the metaphysics of our age. It's the way being appears to us. And certainly we're rushing into the future with no categories by which we can judge it. That was a conversation in 1969 between Grant and Horowitz, at least the start of a conversation. As one might notice in these responses, Grant was influenced by Heidegger's claim that the essence of technology is that it inframes. It inframes the world. In this world, everything, including us human inhabitants, become indifferent stuff to be molded, manipulated, and made for use. Only then might meaning be provisionally bestowed until the substrate for doing is used up. The aim is to acquire a particular modality of, of, of power that asserts dominance and control over the objects awaiting meaning-making activity. Thus all things, including human things, are objectified, ordered, and put to process or to procedure or for, for those being replaced, put out to pasture. This describes the metaphysics of the modern world. It's how we've come to see the nature of things. Put differently, the impact of techno-ontology upon our society is that it has schematized everything into categories for calculation, quantification, and use. As Grant suggested, it is by the technological means that we approach every crisis we encounter, including the crisis of technology itself. The result of this circular trap is that we struggle to see the essence of technology, and we fail to judge it rightly. But perhaps this is our fate. We fail to judge technology rightly, and we fail to ready ourselves for protest because we are as technology has made us. Uh, I'm going to quickly read something to close. It comes from Jonathan Swift, Swift's little satire uh, entitled The Battle of the Books. He describes the battle between books and a library. Uh, In a sense, he's trying to examine the battle between ancient ways of knowing or teaching or providing instruction in an educational institution uh, with modern ways. And in this satire, he draws upon the imagery of spiders and bees. Spiders are uh, the image of modernity, and bees are the image of the ancient ways. So if you let me read just a, a brief vignette, I'd appreciate it. Not to disparage myself, said he, the spider, by the comparison with such a rascal. What art thou but a vagabond without house or home, without stock or inheritance, born to no possession of your own, but a pair of wings and a drone pipe? Speaking of the bee. Your livelihood is a universal plunder upon nature, a freebooter over fields and gardens, and for the sake of stealing will will rob a nettle as easily as a violet, whereas I am a domestic animal furnished with a native stock within myself. This, this large castle, to show my improvements in the mathematics, is all built with my own hands, 
and the materials extracted altogether out of my own person. That's the spider speaking. I am glad, answered the bee, to hear you grant at least that I am come honestly by my wings and my voice. For then it seems I am obliged to heaven alone for my flights and my music. And providence would never have bestowed on me two such gifts without designing them for the noblest ends. I visit, indeed, all the flowers and blossoms of the field and garden, but whatever I collect thence enriches myself without the least injury to their beauty, their smell, or their taste. Now, for you and your skill in architecture and other mathematics, I have little to say. In that building of of yours there might, for, for aught I know, have been labor and method enough, but by woeful experience for us both, it is too plain the materials are not. And I hope you will henceforth take warning and consider duration and matter as well as method and art. You boast, indeed, of being obliged to no other creature, but of drawing and spinning out of spinning out all from yourself. That is to say, if we may judge of the liquor in the vessel by which by what issues out, you possess a good plentiful store of dirt and poison in your breast. And though I would by no means lessen or disparage your genuine stock of either, yet I doubt you are somewhat obliged for an increase of both to a little foreign assistance. Your inherent portion of dirt does not fail of acquisitions by sweepings exhaled from below, and one insect furnishes you with a share of poison to destroy another. So that in short, the question comes all to this. Whether is the nobler of being of the two, or whether the nobler, nobler being of the two, that which by a lazy contemplation of four inches round, by an overweening pride, feeding and engendering on itself, turns all into excrement and venom, producing nothing at all but flybane and a cobweb. Or that, by a universal range, with long search, much study, true judgment, and distinction of things, brings home honey and wax. Jonathan Swift. I should have just read that from the start. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious whether um, different origin stories would make any difference to your analysis. So for a little, um, he goes even beyond, you know, what Augustine and Calvin might say, and and you know, in one of his papers, he says, um, you know, God had no technology in mind. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, we would have sat there, and God would have fed us. Versus, say, um, John Walton's uh, work on Genesis, where he talks about it being a f- uh, a functional, efficient creation, an ordered creation, still in need of humans doing more ordering. Mm. So Alul naturally leads in one direction for an attitude of technology, partly where he starts from. Mm-hmm. But I'm just wondering whether where you start from would change anything that you've said. Yeah, I, I think uh, a simple answer is... If you have a different starting place, you naturally end up in a different, uh, at the very least, you, you have a very different journey. You might end up in the same place, but uh, the, the journey looks different. Now, in regards to the, the place that, that I start, I, I, I probably agree with, with somebody like, uh, like Mumford, who, who argues that, that uh, tools are, are already sort of an embodied reality, hands and teeth and feet. Uh, these these things allow us to do things. What they allow us to get on in the world, and I, and I, I see these as good gifts uh, of of God. Um, and, and I think that's the, the right place to begin, us trying to understand what technology is in some forms, uh, because it takes the body quite seriously. And so the, I, I begin, I think theologically in a position of trying to wrestle what it means to be incarnated, as to have flesh, uh, to be a body, for my soul uh, to be 
uh, spoken in bodily form. I mean, that's, that's uh, an enduring expression of the Christian tradition, and it is where we begin. In, in the creation narrative, uh, we are, are given flesh. We're given a body. A body to do what? To, to play in the world. To engage with God and with our fellows. So indeed, we have tools, uh, tools in, in body. And, and I agree with Mumford that, that machines become extensions of, uh, of, of the body. And that's all well and good. But modern technology is quite different from that. Mumford doesn't see necessarily a distinction between the two. But I, I see a change in, in the modern period. I see a change emerging from uh, uh, possibly as early as a filioque, maybe maybe sooner, uh, but certainly a, a difference in the, in the in the Renaissance um, about the way in which technology begins determining who we are, uh, in which the body becomes something quite different. It becomes, as I mentioned, an inert object, uh, and so I return then to to the, a, a creation narrative, to, to interrogate, to interrogate the modern body, which is dead flesh waiting to be animated. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's where I'm, I'm at. Yeah, Ashley, um, thanks a lot for the talk, really appreciated it. Um, I have sort of a a cheeky way and a polite way of asking my question. Go with so cheeky. I'll go with cheeky, of course. Um, what is the art of living in the technological age? Yeah, nice. Um, it, anyway, to, to be a little more polite, um, you know, you mentioned how it's kind of our ontology now. We kind of breathe it in a way that we can't know anything outside of it, and I think that that's really insightful. Um, you also talk a lot about there are things that we should protest, um, which I also agree with. But what's what's sort of the outcome of this protest? What's a good way to engage in protest? Is there a positive way of living that mm. counts as both protest and maybe a sign of yeah. you know a better uh, future? Yeah. Presumably. Our faith has some kind of resources here. Yeah, um, but I'm just kind of teeing this up for you to talk about. Yeah, uh, good, good questions. Uh, so the the title of the book is "The Art of Living for the Technological Age," and uh, the that phrase "art of living" is is the way in which the Swiss theologian Karl Barth uh, describes wisdom. So uh, a, a different title would be "Wisdom for the Technological Age." And so then, well, what's wisdom? Well, we've got to probe that a little bit. There's uh, different expressions of what wisdom is in the Christian traditions. Um, the Lutheran uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes wisdom as being able to see the essential nature of things. So in, a, in, um, in, in the way in which I, I, I'm trying to read what technology is. Well, what is this? Begging that question. By begging that question and seeking the answer, we are um, laboring to pursue wisdom and awaiting our encounter with wisdom. So we're, we're invited to pursue uh, Sophia or wis wisdom, but wisdom's always given as gift. And so the art of living for me is this, I, I think in many ways, the process of, of learning to see the world well, to see we in the world well. And it, it is this long labor of being formed. Um, some might attribute that long labor to the formation of character or virtue. I'm not necessarily quite there yet, but in previous writings I talked about the formation of postures that ready us to, to get on with, uh, to be able to encounter the crises of the world. But one of, what's interesting in that, in that exercise is that I don't do that alone. So in regards to questions of protest, how do we do this? We must, we must do it in, uh, we must do it as human beings and therefore we must do it in relation to, with, and for our fellows, both near and far. And by using that language of near and far, uh, our fellow humans are who are like us, and our fellow humans are quite different from us. Uh, we're human only in relation to each other. And it's that, it's that relationality, it's that community that can sustain us in times of, of crisis 
and calamity. And so the, the, the project, you're asking sort of questions about what this book project's going to look like in the end. Uh, I've not written the end yet, but I'm moving in that direction. I'm going to try to open up a, uh, a theological anthropology, which, which is used to uh, interrupt techno-ontology, uh, to re-narrate who we are in this world so that we can protest well, resist well, so that we might flourish as human beings in a technological age which isn't going anywhere. And so I'm not protesting in order to return us to some, uh, you know, pre-modern age. That's not going to happen. Uh, I agree with, with Grant that technology is the way the world is. Well, how do we flourish? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. I'm somewhat editing my question because it had a lot of that ground covered in that question. Um, but I guess uh, for me, as, as someone that's not a student at Regent, someone that's two years into being saved, um, uh, maybe a book or a couple of books in the Bible that you would recommend uh, for me to, to pour through to start to develop um, mm. a solid understanding of, of technology in the yeah. Bible. Great question. Um, George Grant's Technology and Justice is a, is a lovely place to start. It's a, it's a series of um, five essays. Uh, the first essay takes up quite explicitly the question of technology, uh, but he deals with, uh, in that book, uh, I, think that, I think it's the second essay, he talks about the multiversity. So it's a critique of the way in which the university is, is sort of a, expresses itself in the modern in the modern age and uh, that book ends with two essays that he co-wrote with his wife Sheila that take up questions like um, euthanasia or medical assistance in dying uh, and um, termination of pregnancies uh, it's, a, it's a bit of date it's a dated book but it's a, it's a good place to start um, a more technical book to read but but excellent is um, Brian Brock's Christian ethics in the technological age it's a technical read, but it's it's exhaustive and it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then Grant suggested we read Alul, so technological society and propaganda. And of course, all of my books. Don't forget about my books. It's a third plug. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ashley, for your. Uh, Presentation, and I wish you. you the best as you bring your book to uh, fruition. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I sensed a, uh, a, a, an attempt to define. Th I mean, uh, defining technology was a big part of your mm -hmm. part, part of your talk, and I think a, a, the, a good definition ought to be one that can be agreed to by people who are Christians and who are not Christians. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the previous questioner did ask a, about some resources. Uh, uh, for within from within the Christian tradition as well, uh, in particular, and and um, in addition to that, I think I sensed a little bit of a of a tenor of 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 watch out for problems of technology um, more than let's develop excellent uh, technology. Uh, and I wonder if 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 this definition from a book by Stephen Monsma, editor, uh, the book is called Responsible Technology from 1986. I think Erdman's. Um, this is how they define technology in that book, and it overlaps a lot with the definitions you've had, but it has some distinct features which, which may be valuable to consider some of the positive ways in which technology can be developed. So uh, they define it like this. We can define technology as a distinct human cultural activity in which humans, human beings exercise freedom and responsibility in response to God by forming and transforming the natural creation with the aid of tools and procedures for practical ends and purposes. So the, the, the part that's different in the definitions that you haven't, that you have used in your talk were, is that this is talking about a, a response to God. Um, and I think it, it's important to recognize that technology is not only a response to our human fellows, mm -hmm. but also a response, a, a response to God. And perhaps I, I wonder if, if there's something in, in this call that God gives us to develop the creation um, that allows us to explore what is wonderful and beautiful and excellent about about technologies, um, not in the sense that we should just sort of 
throw caution aside and do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but is there is there a call for Christians in particular to develop excellent technologies? Yeah, I think I think there is. There's a, there's a call for all of us uh, to develop uh, excellent technologies, whether we're uh, uh, Christian or of uh, some other uh, religious background. Uh, and I think I think Swift captures that in his image of the spider and the bee. Uh, the, the bee is going out and and laboring diligently to create wonderful things, honey and wax, beautiful things that, that give it life. And yet it, it, it also gives life to other things through pollinating plants, by ensuring that, that we all have food. Uh, so I think, I think in regards to, to the call, we need to be as bees rather than spiders. We need to be those who produce honey and wax rather than excrement and venom. Uh, we ought not to dominate nature in order to destroy it. We ought not to, to treat nature as, as meaningless objects that we need meaning making and discard it if they're of no use. So I, I think you're exactly right. We do need, we ought to pursue the good things of, uh, of, of our creative agency. Uh, and indeed, wisdom, I think, is a category that I'll explore later in the volume, and I think it's appropriate because um, look at the way Sophia is described in biblical text. She's playful in the world, creating. Oh, that's interesting. Wisdom must, there must be something there about creating. Uh, so I certainly think we should, be, we should be pursuing this scientific inquiry. We should be pursuing the construction of interesting Things I'm not a Luddite. I like technology. I like my computer and, and my phone, and uh, especially like my car. And uh, I, I like these things. I love. I don't know if I love these things, but I like these things quite quite a lot. Uh, and and I think that they're beautiful. Right. I'm, I even drive. I just drive a Mazda, and I think it's a beautiful vehicle. Uh, and 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 so I. But. At what cost? Uh, at what cost? OK, thank you very much. Thanks. Ashley, we will allow two remaining questions with the two individuals at the mic. So first here, and then Tim can have the last question. Thanks. Thanks. Could it be that another definition for technology would be that human-made technology replaces human activity, causes great unemployment and loss of retirement for many while being serving mammon to create cheaper, more efficient ways to create human aims. I, I think all of that uh, is, is fair game in regards to a critique of the ontology of technology or, or, or uh, technology is the ontology of, of our age. I think those are very real um, um, very real claims, true claims. Remember, technology can take on many forms, not just in regards to industrial mechanics, but in politics, in ethics, in economics. Uh, we can see the, the fruit of modern technology in all these places, and what's its aim? Efficiency. Uh, rather than, than the flourishing of, of human beings. So I think those are all fair game. Yep. Thanks for the lecture. Um, if I understood you well, in the beginning you were arguing that technology should not be used to produce weapons. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about some extreme case, cases. For instance, nowadays a city in Iraq being invaded by I ISIS. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that be a good use for a weapon? Um, that's a, it's a it's a tough it's a tough question. Let me just give this uh, as 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 a response. Um, a group of, of of monks in Algeria were facing um, very real risk of being murdered by some 
radicalized fundamentalist warriors, we'll say, uh, in, their, in their country. And they chose to stay. Why? Because these monks provided a service for the townspeople whom they'd lived with for years. These are Catholic monks living in a, a Muslim community. They provide medical aid and education and provided care. Uh, they were kidnapped and murdered. There's a letter that Dom Christian, uh, one of the monks, wrote. Uh, he wrote a goodbye letter. And uh, in that letter, it's a beautiful letter about the reality of facing imminent death um, at the hands of the other. And his response in the letter is he prayed that he would see his fellow in heaven. And he simply declared, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So, can I justify the use of weapons? Never. I can't. Even in the face of a heinous enemy. Karl Barth has a beautiful description. I think it's in, in volume three of his dogmatics. Uh, uh, anytime you say like volume three, you know it's a, it's a lot of words. Uh, but volume three of his dogmatics, he, 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 he's asking the question about um, the ethics of, of violence and self-defense. And in the end, he cries foul. The question is flawed. Um, at what stage does the other before you become an enemy? For that other is always the one who we are to love, even unto death. So I, I can't, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a good Anabaptist, though. Um, and so I, I don't think there's ever justification for that. But that's uh, an enduring sort of theological legacy that, that I'm... Uh, I find great truth in. Thanks for the question.